By late 2020, a woman by the name of Victoria Gray had gone from a year free from many of her symptoms associated with the debilitating case of sickle cell anemia. This made worldwide news because, after all, sickle cell has been an incurable genetic disorder. The disease is caused by misshaped blood cells due to a mutation in the protein hemoglobin. Instead of being round, these sickle crescent-shaped blood cells get jammed in blood vessels, causing agonizing pain. They also do a worse job at transporting oxygen throughout the body. Based on her own statements, Victoria was concerned that she wouldn't be around for her kids' graduations, weddings, and grandchildren. Well, that is until a clinical trial came about that offered hope. Cells were taken from her body, genetically edited using a technology called CRISPR, to fix what was wrong and redeposit it. She was a first, but surely not the last, to have their lives utterly transformed by this gene editing technology. Gene editing, it is as powerful as it sounds. Scientists are now able to change the code of life with relative ease and insert these changes into living organisms. Gene editing is not a new practice. In fact, many of the foods we eat, certainly those found in packaged foods such as chips and box cereals, have already been altered by gene editing. However, there is a new technique known as CRISPR that has turned the field on its head, empowering scientists to perform the task much more generally across species and cell types. What is significant about CRISPR is the increased speed and efficiency of gene editing and the variety and number of investigators that are now able to perform such research across many fields. CRISPR has the potential to dramatically change how we treat disease, what we eat, and maybe even how we age. As a synthetic biology tool, CRISPR has already been used in cancer immunotherapies that transform cells into cancer-seeking destroyers. It's being investigated to correct genetic disorders. It's being investigated to make our foods more robust to drought, pests, and disease. It's being aimed at pests like mosquitoes to reduce their numbers and thus disease transmission. It's even being explored to bring species such as the woolly mammoth back from extinction. All of these advances are thanks to effective and efficient mechanisms for cutting genes to remove unwanted traits or insert new traits. To gauge how far we have come, I sometimes examine past predictions of scientists and writers, including that of the late Dr. Isaac Asimov. Dr. Asimov wrote hundreds of nonfiction and fiction books. Yes, hundreds. Movies and TV programs such as iRobot and Foundation continue to be made of his work even decades after his death. And some of his original works were a significant influence for Star Wars. He appeared on the David Letterman Show in 1980 and made predictions about genetic testing at birth, synthetic insulin, our ability to conduct gene therapy, and potential cancer cures. Many of his predictions seem like science fiction back in 1980, but they have come to pass. Children indeed do get tested for genetic disease. We really do fiddle around with genes to address specific diseases such as cancer. And we can indeed change the code in cells to address the body's production of insulin. It is this technology called CRISPR, first proposed in 2012 and awarded a Nobel Prize in 2020, that has revolutionized and revitalized research aiming to redesign organisms for many human purposes. 
CRISPR has provided the power, adaptability, affordability, and access lacking in earlier techniques. For example, CRISPR is spurring exploration into de-extinction. This is where scientists are exploring methods to reestablish long extinct species, or at least chimeras, where genomes of extinct species are married with still living species. In Greek mythology, chimeras are monsters of mixed origin, such as a lion mixed with a goat. In modern biology, the term chimera is used to describe an organism that is a patchwork of different species. This chimeric or patchwork method is being explored for de-extinction of both the woolly mammoth and the passenger pigeon, among other species. But CRISPR has far more practical applications as well. For one, it is particularly well-suited to confront genetic disease. By replacing incorrect letters in the genetic code with proper letters, CRISPR seems the best chance we have to address some of those disorders to date. For example, in Tay-Sachs disease, babies are born with just one improper base pair arrangement among billions of letters of the genetic code. The gene and the corresponding protein enzyme responsible for Tay-Sachs doesn't properly break down fats in the baby's brain as it develops. As a result, the brain suffocates as these fat products accumulate in the brain tissue. The child often dies before reaching adolescence. Several studies involving CRISPR show promising results in addressing this disorder through changing the gene mutation to a normal gene. Although much work still needs to be done to ensure safety and efficacy. Some argue Given the devastation of these diseases, it is our moral obligation to push for cures if we have the power to do so. CRISPR is also being explored in a host of cancer immunotherapies. Promising results have been achieved for some cancers where a patient's own immune cells are programmed to attack cancerous cells. Researchers created a therapy that takes T cells from a patient and alters them with an artificial T cell receptor engineered to target and destroy cancer cells. This approach is called chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy or CAR T therapy for short. This is one of the most promising outcomes of synthetic biology, again, fueled by CRISPR. Here, white blood cells removed from a patient are reprogrammed to recognize antigens on cancerous cells. The patient cells are then reproduced, tested, and reintroduced into the patient. When the engineered cells come in contact with the cancerous cells, an immune response is triggered and the newly engineered white blood cells attack the cancer. Results have also been shown to be persistent in patients, providing longer-term protection. CRISPR is the first technology with a demonstrated potential to alter genes of many species with relative precision. Moreover, it is also relatively cheap and easy to use. The genes of many organisms across the world have been successfully altered by CRISPR already. Now, before you yourself take a stab at genome engineering, when I say cheap and easy, I mean for specialists with years of experience working in a lab outfitted with thousands of dollars worth of equipment. However, the fundamentals of this technology are not beyond the general public. Indeed, some advocate for much wider inclusion of novices in synthetic biology research. In fact, there is a culture surrounding synthetic biology that is more akin to early Silicon Valley than to traditional molecular biology research. CRISPR-based techniques have inspired a culture of tinkering and exploring with genomes. 
There are all types of maker spaces around the world where experienced and not so experienced researchers participate in synthetic biology to fiddle with life. To build and design a CRISPR experiment, scientists often work with companies that mail them unique CRISPR toolkits to help them design and build new biomolecules that have the power to alter organisms. Scientists can simply go online, go to a repository such as AdGene, design their experiment in order. Now, before you get any bright ideas about altering humans, yes, you, after all, I never suggested we should cure disease by creating semi-synthetic humans. I simply presented a problem such as recessive genetic disorders and introduced a powerful technology, CRISPR. But in all seriousness, you can see how organically science can evolve when huge historical challenges meet a sudden technology offering to address them. The urge is to simply jump into the work, sometimes without giving as much thoughtfulness to negative consequences as we should. In fact, co-discoverer of CRISPR, Dr. Jennifer Doudna, called for a moratorium on CRISPR editing of cells that confer heredity, such as sperm and eggs. She did so in 2015, three years after her initial discoveries. Other pioneers in the development of CRISPR, including Doudna's collaborator and co-recipient of the 2020 Nobel Prize for their work, Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier, signed a similar call for a moratorium on so-called germline editing in 2019. Indeed, the power of CRISPR is a minefield of bioethics concerns from threats of human experimentation that could lead to human suffering to developments of bioweapons and superbugs. But before we get into the ethics and social implications of CRISPR, or even before we discuss how likely any of these outcomes are, let's focus on the basic biology of CRISPR and how it works. After which, you might be able to contemplate for yourself how biologically sound some of the aforementioned ideas are. Now, the bioengineering of organisms is not new. It started with our ancestors thousands of years ago, selecting for edible plants for favorable characteristics generation after generation. For example, we owe much of our modern diet to natives of North and South America. By selecting crops such as corn, llama beans, peanuts, peppers, potatoes, squash, sunflowers, and sweet potatoes, our human ancestors were effectively engineering the foods we eat throughout hundreds and often thousands of years of artificial selection. In fact, new research suggests the mighty Amazon rainforest, often thought of as an untouched, unspoiled landscape, was profoundly changed by thousands of years of indigenous agriculture. Our human ancestors selecting edible and useful plants year after year to plant and grow. Does the Amazon owe its productivity and at least in part to humans? Perhaps. In terms of understanding heredity, it took all of human history, 200,000 years or so, until 1866. Gregor Mendel proposed the concept of genes, which he called factors, based on his experiments with garden peas. It took another 87 years until 1953 to discover the three-dimensional structure of DNA. It took a period of 13 years from 1990 to 2003 to decode the human genome, which involved identifying and mapping all of the genes in humans a feat involving many scientists with an approximate cost of $3 billion. By 2016, the cost of sequencing had fallen from millions in 2003 for the Human Genome Project to only $1,000, a rate of technological change even faster than Moore's law for transistors on a chip. 
By 2019, at least one company was offering to sequence a human genome for approximately $100. And by the time you experience this lesson, the price will likely be lower. There are methods of genome engineering other than CRISPR that are still used today, particularly where effective research constructs have already been built around them. But they pale in comparison to CRISPR's flexibility in terms of the number of different types of experiments that can be performed, as well as the reductions in time and costs. CRISPR isn't perfect. There are still kinks to work out. For example, sometimes cleavage is not specific to the site intended, but newer and more accurate and more versatile versions of the technology continue to be developed. So, what is CRISPR in biological terms? Let's delve deeper into the specific mechanisms. CRISPR is an acronym, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Its name describes a particular type of repeats in the system's molecular components. Scientists found that in some bacterial cells, there were clusters of repeated sequences of DNA. The repeated sequences were palindromic, meaning the letters of the genetic code within these segments were at the same on, in both directions on complementary strands. The word mom is a palindrome, for example. These clusters of repeated palindromic sequences were interrupted by sequences of unknown DNA. So here you had repeated palindromes inner space with novel DNA. Also, these repeats are bordered by CRISPR-associated genes, known for short as Cas genes. These Cas genes code for two things, proteins called nucleases that cut DNA, as well as proteins called helicases that unwind DNA. Scientists eventually recognize that some spaces of DNA in the bacteria correspond to viral DNA. Then scientists figured out that these copies of viral DNA amounted to a bacterial immune system. The palindromes tend to direct the formation of helical structures that in this case work to keep the various parts of the CRISPR apparatus intact. As it turns out, bacterial cells were using the CRISPR system to do two things. First, copy new segments of the viral DNA into the CRISPR system as spaces. Second, transcribe the stored segments of DNA into the CRISPR system in order to recognize viral strains that had reinfected the bacterial cell. When an old sequence of viral DNA is recognized, the bacteria could deploy the CRISPR RNA and its nucleases to identify and cut the viral DNA injected into the cell, thereby inactivating the virus. Scientists were not just observing a bacterial immune system, but an immune system that had adaptive immunity, more sophisticated than scientists had known existed for bacterial cells. Adaptive immunity involves the detection, identification, and memorization of foreign invaders or pathogens. In case of a second infection from the same pathogen, if a system recognizes the foreign agent up front, they can mount a more effective and aggressive secondary attack. In fact, vaccines operate based on this premise. Scientists produce vaccines to trigger an immune response in you so that if you were to come in contact with a pathogen you have been vaccinated against, you can mount a more effective secondary response. The magic is in your immune system. When viruses invade a cell, it is a very intimate infection. Certain viruses actually inject their own DNA into the cell normally reprogramming the host to produce more viruses. The host cell may then explode with new viral particles. 
However, viruses that invade bacterial cells that are CRISPR enabled have a very different experience. Their DNA can be cut into short segments that inactivate the virus. And the segments of the viral DNA are then added to the CRISPR apparatus. Like a vaccine with the pieces of virus interspaced among the palindromic repeats. To understand why CRISPR is so powerful, it's important to keep in mind how numerous viruses are. It's estimated that for every bacterial cell on Earth, there are 10 viruses. This is one reason viruses exert a tremendous force, not only on the ecology of infectious disease, but also on the exchange of genetic information across the spectrum of life. The CRISPR system engages in this exchange of genetic material by cutting strands of viral DNA before an infection takes hold. Again, scientists realize this system had all the parts necessary to potentially edit whichever genome sequence scientists chose. Overall, CRISPR technology is based on at least three main features. CRISPR-associated genes like Cas9 to code for proteins that cut DNA, guide RNA that is programmable, targeting particular gene sequences, and DNA molecules added to the system to implant a desired gene into the host cell. Now, the Cas9 system normally cuts the DNA of foreign viruses, but scientists hijack this system to target cells of their own choosing. Cas9 is the first protein associated with the CRISPR-Cas system that could be domesticated, so to speak, to do the cutting of DNA on our behalf. Scientists created a technology out of the understanding of basic biology of the CRISPR system in order to cut whatever DNA segments we want. Building on earlier work, what 2020 Nobel Prize winners Doudna and Charpentier realized was that the CRISPR system found in nature can be re-engineered to target sequences we choose. What they did was add genetic sequences they manufactured called guide RNA to the CRISPR complex. This innovation is what makes CRISPR compatible with practically any species that scientists want to target. Here's how guide RNA works. Say scientists want to inactivate gene A in a mouse. They would simply select a sequence of approximately 20 base pairs that correspond to gene A, which would tell the CRISPR system to make a cut at that precise location using one of the Cas endonucleases to make breaks in the target sequence. Now, when the DNA is cut, causing a double-stranded break, the cell is triggered to respond, employing one of two pathways for DNA repair. Remember, when a cut is made, the DNA molecule will need to be repaired to be made whole. One pathway is called non-homologous enjoining. The process tends to be error-prone and often simply deactivates the gene altogether. Extra bases can be added, but that's because this is just a sloppy mechanism of repair, as the ends of the DNA are ligated or glued back together without a homologous template, which would have prevented deletions and mutations. However, using the CRISPR system, scientists can add template DNA to guide the rebuilding of the DNA. That's how they push it to the other repair pathway, which is more precise. This is called homology-directed repair. This approach incorporates longer strands of DNA matching sequences adjacent to the cleavage site, which CRISPR will introduce. This sets up less error-prone repair mechanisms of homology-directed pathway, which allows scientists to add genes or genetic sequences in a very efficient manner. Notice the power and importance of basic scientific research in all of this. CRISPR started as a foray into the world of basic science, 
before became applied in technology. The terms technology and science are often conflated, but they are really quite different. Science is inquiry and asks questions, often for the question's sake, while technology applies basic science for a human benefit. CRISPR started as an attempt by scientists to better understand how bacterial cells function and then understand how bacteria respond to viral pathogens. This seemingly remote exploration of an E. coli immune system created the knowledge that led to the creation of revolutionary technology that may change what we eat, how we deal with often deadly and debilitating disease, and perhaps even how we age. Ongoing research into basic biological questions is indispensable because humans are just not capable of predicting what topic will lead to the next technological breakthrough, even for fields as applied as synthetic biology. And yet, cable news programs and other outlets sometimes make fun of basic biology. And I admit, some of the projects and topics sound hilarious. For example, questions are sometimes raised about, you know, why federal agencies use millions of dollars to study fruit flies. Well, for one, fruit flies can produce in a new generation every two weeks. And if you want to see the inherited effects of genetic change, having a new generation every two weeks lets you study dozens of generations of fruit flies in just one year. Moreover, because fruit flies are so easy to study, much of what we know about modern genetics have been derived from the use of fruit flies as model organisms to study fundamental processes of genetics and cell theory. One of the things I hope to get across in this course is a sense of humility. Unfortunately, scientists aren't smart enough to know exactly in advance what to study and how to solve some of humanity's most pressing problems. And I don't want you to think that biologists are now able to conjure up any organism with any traits they wish. Genetic engineering is still very much a maze of new information and technologies. We aren't yet able to predict all the results of our changes. There are complex secondary interactions among genes and proteins. If science has changed just one gene, it often impacts many others. For example, researchers have been frustrated with the result of using CRISPR on embryos. They were attempting to target individual genes for blindness, for example, yet what happened instead was entire chromosomes were deleted. Embryos are a special case because of their complexity and developmental nature, but also a stark reminder of our current limitations. Understanding the inner impacts and interactions of genes is a bottleneck in genetics research we'll consider later in the course, when we talk about bioinformatics and artificial intelligence and how they help us evaluate these complex interactions. Also, there is no lack of justified concern about the potential darker side of CRISPR. In theory, CRISPR could be used to build superhumans and redefine what it means to be human. Although this seems far-fetched, there are many ethical implications of exploring synthetic alterations to humans that don't directly address disease or suffering. When, if ever, might the risk of this type of research be justified? Also, what are the ethical implications of not using such a powerful technology to save lives? Again, society will have to answer each of these questions and consistently grapple with the new power scientists have to fundamentally alter the evolutionary trajectory of species, including our own. Rarely do you find a new technology that has the potential to transform fields as disparate as medicine, including vaccines and cancer treatments, to the environmental sciences, including conservation, biology, agriculture, pest and invasive species management, and energy. 
It is a technology that inspires both hope and fears based on its ability to alter life. Also, changes we make to germ cells, also known as sperm and eggs, may be on a permanent basis. Germ cells hold a key to the evolutionary path of species. By altering germ cells of species using CRISPR, scientists now have the ability to alter future generations in a single experiment. Think about that. Evolution is an iterative process in which species are influenced just one organism at a time. They are selected on the basis of environmental factors and processes often slowly, sometimes over millions of years before those random changes affect an entire species, allowing them to be more suited to their environment. Now, we are looking at making such changes in an instant. We can now implant genes and germ cells that could continue to be passed on to future offspring in perpetuity. Now that's powerful stuff. CRISPR is a technology that will appear throughout this course. It will appear when we discuss the construction of molecular machines that produce industrial products. CRISPR will appear when we discuss cancer treatments via immunotherapy. It will appear when we cover vaccine development and viruses. When we discuss gene drives and solutions to environmental problems. CRISPR will come up when we review bioinformatics and computation, agriculture applications in space, regenerative medicine, and threats from synthetic biology. Gene editing is an ever-evolving tool in the synthetic biology arsenal. Although imperfect, the pace of progress is breathtaking, with new advancements occurring on a regular basis. Next time, we will begin to discuss another fascinating application of our new synthetic biology tools, DNA computing. The development of DNA computing is a direct result of our ability to read, write, and edit DNA at a high level. See you there.